2.622 million square kilometers. That's how much of China's territory had turned to desert, more than a quarter of the entire nation. For decades, sandstorms tore through northern regions with brutal regularity, burying crops, suffocating livestock, and forcing families to abandon their homes. The Mu'us Desert alone sent millions of tons of sand cascading toward populated areas each year, turning skies orange and air unbreathable. This wasn't just an environmental crisis. It was an existential threat to food security, public health, and economic survival. Then something extraordinary happened. China's desert problem was never abstract. At its peak, desertified land stretched across 2.622 million square kilometers, an area larger than Algeria, the 10th largest country on Earth. That represented 27.4% of China's total landmass, transformed into shifting dunes and barren rock. The northern provinces bore the worst of it. Every spring, massive sandstorms would roll south and east, carrying millions of tons of particulate matter. Beijing, over 800 kilometers from the nearest major desert, would disappear under yellow clouds so thick that visibility dropped to less than 100 meters. Schools closed, hospitals filled with respiratory cases, flights were grounded, but the real devastation happened in rural communities directly adjacent to expanding deserts. Villages watched helplessly as dunes swallowed their fields season after season. Crops that managed to sprout would be buried overnight by sand driven by relentless winds. Livestock died, sometimes from starvation as grasslands vanished, sometimes simply lost in blinding sandstorms. Entire families disappeared during particularly severe weather events. The economic toll was catastrophic, but the human cost was worse. Communities that had farmed the same land for generations were being erased. The Chinese government recognized that this wasn't a problem that would solve itself. Starting in 1988, authorities launched systematic tree planting campaigns across desert regions. The scale was unprecedented. Over the following decades, more than 100 billion trees were planted in arid zones. By the early 2000s, the strategy had evolved into a comprehensive assault on desertification. The government established 41 demonstration zones specifically designed to test and refine desert control techniques. These weren't symbolic gestures. They were large-scale engineering and ecological projects backed by massive investment. The approach combined multiple tactics. Afforestation remained central. But scientists added protective enclosures covering 26.58 million acres of vulnerable land, preventing further degradation while natural recovery processes took hold. They implemented strict grazing restrictions, giving stripped grasslands time to regenerate. Approximately 280 million acres of desert land saw measurable improvement through these interventions. For the first time in modern history, China's deserts were retreating instead of advancing. Satellite imagery confirmed what ground observers were reporting. Green was pushing back yellow. But planting trees was one thing. Growing food in the desert was another challenge entirely. The Mu'us Desert stretches across the border between Inner Mongolia and Shanxi Province in northwestern China. On any map, it appears as a forbidding yellow expanse. 42,200 square kilometers of sand, rock, and scrubland. For centuries, it served as a textbook example of land too hostile for agriculture. Annual rainfall averages between 250 and 440 millimeters, barely enough to support hardy desert shrubs, let alone crops. Summer temperatures regularly exceed 40 degrees Celsius, while winter nights plunge below freezing. The soil, what little exists beneath the sand, contains almost no organic matter and holds water about as well as a sieve. This was among China's most impoverished regions. Communities eked out survival through marginal herding and occasional trade, but opportunities were scarce and conditions harsh. Young people fled to cities, leaving aging populations behind. The prevailing wisdom was simple. You don't farm deserts. 
you survive them, barely, or you leave. Chinese scientists didn't accept that conclusion. Starting in 2016, research teams began experimenting with drought-resistant saplings in the Mu'us Desert, using what they termed minimally invasive planting methods. The technique involved creating small pockets of prepared soil for each sapling rather than attempting to amend large areas, reducing environmental disruption while maximizing each plant's survival odds. The approach worked. Trees that should have died within weeks began taking root. Local farmers watched these experiments with keen interest. If trees could survive, perhaps crops could too. Some began their own small-scale trials with potatoes, chosen because the tubers are relatively drought-tolerant compared to grains like wheat or rice. Initial results were disappointing. Yields were far below commercial viability. But they proved something crucial. With the right conditions, the desert could support food crops. That proof of concept triggered a much larger investigation. In 2018, the Chinese government dispatched a dedicated scientific team to the Mu'us Desert for comprehensive soil and climate analysis. Researchers dug test pits, analyzed sand composition, measured moisture retention, studied water table depths, and monitored seasonal temperature variations. Their conclusion surprised even optimists in the agricultural community. Certain sections of the desert possessed latent agricultural potential. The soil wasn't as hopeless as it appeared. With sufficient water and proper amendment, it could be coaxed into productivity. In October 2018, based on these findings, local authorities announced an ambitious initiative, a $350 million project to convert desert into farmland. The goal wasn't modest reclamation, it was transformation at scale. Skeptics were numerous. International agricultural experts questioned whether the investment made economic sense. Even within China, some viewed the plan as overly optimistic, possibly wasteful. Desert farming had been attempted many times throughout history, in many places, with consistently poor results. The project launched in 2019 with a team of approximately 12 agricultural specialists working alongside local farmers. Together, they represented the collaboration the project needed, scientific expertise combined with practical farming knowledge and intimate familiarity with local conditions. They selected a 20-acre test plot for initial experiments, treating it as a proving ground for techniques that might eventually scale to thousands of acres. The central challenge was obvious. Water. The Mu'us Desert receives minimal rainfall, and what does fall quickly percolates through the sandy soil or, you know, just evaporates in the intense summer heat. Without consistent irrigation, any crops would wither within days. But bringing water to the desert is expensive and technically difficult. Wells can be drilled, but groundwater in arid regions is often limited and, well, Mining it unsustainably risks permanent depletion. Piping water from distant rivers requires massive infrastructure investment. The solution was both ancient and ingenious, flood irrigation, but deployed with modern timing and control. The Yellow River, China's second longest waterway, flows relatively near portions of the Mu'us Desert. During seasonal swells, particularly spring snowmelt and summer monsoon periods, the river carries massive water volumes. Historically, these surges often cause destructive flooding in downstream areas. The project engineers proposed redirecting some of this excess water into the desert in controlled pulses. When floods were imminent, farmers would open channels, guiding water onto prepared desert plots. The floods accomplished multiple goals simultaneously. They saturated the sand with moisture that would sustain plants for weeks afterward. But crucially, they also deposited silt, nutrient-rich sediment carried by the river from upstream regions. Over repeated flood cycles, this silt began transforming the desert's composition, gradually building a layer of soil that could retain moisture and provide nutrients plants need. The first harvest from that 20-acre experimental plot exceeded expectations, though it remained far below commercial agricultural standards. 
the team pulled 3,000 kilograms of potatoes from the ground, an average of 150 kilograms per acre. That was roughly one-sixth the yield a farmer might expect from prime agricultural land under normal conditions. But context mattered enormously. This was a desert. Six months earlier, the land had been sterile sand incapable of supporting anything beyond scattered desert vegetation. Now it was producing food. The success, modest as it was numerically, demonstrated viability. The methodology worked. Desert agriculture wasn't fantasy. It was difficult, resource intensive and lower yielding than conventional farming, but it was possible. Armed with that proof, the project expanded dramatically. From 20 acres, the cultivated area grew to nearly 4,000 acres. That required scaling up every aspect of the operation. Water management infrastructure, soil preparation, planting and harvesting logistics. More importantly, it required people. The project couldn't succeed with just a handful of scientists and a few experimental plots. It needed a workforce with real stakes in the outcome. Authorities actively recruited farmers from surrounding villages, offering training, technical support, and financial incentives to participate. The pitch was compelling turn wasteland into income. For communities that had struggled economically for generations, the opportunity was, honestly, transformative. Eventually, nearly 12,000 farmers joined the initiative, bringing their labor and local knowledge to the desert reclamation effort. As experience accumulated, yields improved. Farmers and scientists refined their techniques through trial and error, adjusting planting depths, optimizing irrigation timing, experimenting with potato varieties better suited to the conditions, improving soil amendments. By 2023, five years after the project's large-scale launch, the results were remarkable. The 4,000 cultivated acres produced more than 1.7 million kilograms of potatoes annually, with per acre yields climbing to 430 kilograms, nearly triple the initial experimental results. That figure still lagged behind conventional farmland productivity by a significant margin. But the comparison missed the point. This wasn't farmland. It was reclaimed desert. Every kilogram of potatoes represented food grown where food shouldn't exist, on land that would otherwise contribute nothing to human sustenance and might actively threaten nearby productive areas through sand encroachment. The economic impact rippled through participating communities. Farmers who previously struggled to generate income now had a viable cash crop. Some reported annual earnings exceeding $10,000, modest by urban Chinese standards, but substantial for rural areas that had been among the nation's poorest. Young people who had migrated to cities began considering whether they needed to. Villages that had been slowly dying started showing signs of revitalization but the project's significance extended beyond economics. The cultivation process itself helped stabilize the desert. Plant roots anchored sand that would otherwise blow away. Regular irrigation and the resulting vegetation cover reduced wind speeds at ground level. The accumulating organic matter from crop residues gradually improved soil structure. The desert wasn't just producing food, it was becoming less desert-like with each passing season. The Mu Us experience became a template. Chinese authorities identified other degraded desert regions where similar techniques might work. The Kabuki Desert, another major sand sea in Inner Mongolia, became a priority target. Teams replicated the Mu Us approach, combining afforestation, controlled flood irrigation, and careful crop selection to reclaim land and generate agricultural value from areas previously written off. Today, approximately 94% of the Mu Us desert has undergone some form of effective management intervention. That doesn't mean 94% has been converted to farmland. Much of the area remains desert, but stabilized desert, with vegetation cover preventing further expansion and reducing sandstorm intensity. Over 30 villages surrounding the former wasteland have seen measurable improvements in living conditions and economic opportunities. Air quality has improved as sandstorm frequency dropped. Property values increased. 
Children attend schools without seasonal closures caused by blinding yellow clouds. The transformation hasn't gone unnoticed internationally. In February 2023, agricultural officials from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and several other nations with significant desert territories visited the Mu U.S. Desert Project sites. They came seeking transferable knowledge. The Middle East faces severe food security challenges, vast territories incapable of producing significant calories, combined with growing populations and climate change threats that may further stress water resources. The prospect of turning even a fraction of their deserts into productive land is strategically crucial. The visiting delegations ask detailed technical questions. How much water does the system require per acre? Can it work with desalinated seawater? What specific crop varieties perform best? How expensive is the infrastructure investment? How long before reclaimed land reaches acceptable productivity? The Chinese hosts shared data openly, acknowledging both successes and ongoing challenges. The technology isn't a magic solution. It requires substantial capital, consistent water sources, and patient investment before returns materialize. But it works. Other nations are now conducting their own feasibility studies, testing whether Chinese techniques can adapt to their specific desert conditions. The Sahara, the Arabian deserts, the Kalahari, all present different challenges in terms of temperature extremes, soil chemistry, and water availability. But the MUA success proves that deserts aren't automatically permanent wastelands. With sufficient resources and determination, humanity can reclaim some of what has been lost. The broader implications are, honestly, profound. The United Nations estimates that land degradation and desertification affect approximately 2 billion people globally, with 12 million hectares lost to desert expansion each year. That's an area roughly the size of Greece, becoming unproductive annually. Climate change is accelerating the process in many regions, changing precipitation patterns, increasing drought frequency, and raising temperatures all push marginal lands toward desert conditions. If that trend continues unchecked, global food security faces mounting pressure. The human population continues growing while the amount of arable land shrinks. Conventional solutions, increasing crop yields through genetic modification, improving farming efficiency, reducing food waste, all help. But they address the problem from only one direction. Desert reclamation attacks it from another angle, expanding the total amount of productive land rather than just maximizing output from existing farmland. The Chinese Potato Project demonstrates that expansion is possible. It's not easy. It's not cheap. It won't work everywhere. But in specific contexts, with appropriate technology and resources, deserts can feed people instead of threatening them. There are legitimate questions about sustainability. The flood irrigation technique relies on seasonal water surpluses in nearby rivers. What happens if climate change reduces snowpack in the mountains that feed those rivers? What if droughts become longer and more severe? The system might become vulnerable precisely when it's needed most. Engineers and scientists continue working on those problems, developing more efficient irrigation methods, exploring groundwater management strategies, researching crop varieties with even greater drought tolerance. None of this erases the fundamental reality that deserts are difficult environments. They always will be. But the MU-US project has redefined what impossible means in agricultural terms. It has shown that with the right combination of traditional knowledge and modern science, human ingenuity and community commitment, water management and soil amendment, patience and persistence, even the most hostile land can be coaxed into producing life. 12,000 farmers proved that. 1.7 million kilograms of potatoes proved that. Satellite images showing green spreading through yellow prove that. Villages that were dying now thriving prove that. The desert doesn't advance as inevitably as we once believed, and perhaps more importantly, we don't have to retreat as readily as we once did. The line between fertile and barren isn't permanent. It moves, and now we're learning how to move it ourselves.